Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the I Save That webinar series. I'm Judy Thompson, the Director of Clinical Education for AVA, and we welcome you to today's program. Let me get the slides going a little bit for you. So today, it, our, our program is What's New in the Fight Against Catheter-Related Bloodstream Infection? This is our speaker's bio. It will be in the handout section for you. Um, if you've been on waiting for a little bit, you've been able to read this, I'm not gonna read it to you. So um, if you wanna know more about Chris, I'm going to be doing a little intro for her as we finish up the intro to the program today. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy day to uh, spend some time with me and learn about uh, the very important new techniques. Uh, some may be new to you, some may not be, uh, in preventing CRBSI. To start with any good CE program, we have some disclosures. Uh, first of all, I am an employee of RIMED Technologies. I'm the clinical education manager for them. And I also own some stock in Teleflex. Uh, we are not going to be talking about any type of off-label use in this particular presentation. We also have some objectives, like any good CE program. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the current rates of CRBSI in U.S. hospitals. And by current, I'm going to be speaking specifically of 2018 numbers today. Uh, that is as current as uh, has been reported so far. Uh, we're going to discuss some very common strategies for preventing CRBSI, things that we've been doing maybe for years, and some new technologies, new ideas, new methods to reduce the risk of CRBSI. And jumping right in, we're going to have a poll question for you as well. Judy? What is your work setting? One of the following, hospital, home infusion, outpatient, or long-term agency or other? Yeah. I put this question out there to start with because I really want to get an idea of who our audience is today, uh, what type of setting you guys work in, and maybe I can uh, tweak some of the information here more specific to your setting. Well, the results are 78% are in the hospital, 2% home infusion, 16% uh, in long term, and 4% in outpatient infusion. Well, that's fantastic. Um, it's very exciting to see people from across different uh, modalities and locations uh, joining us today and, and all across the United States. And so I'm really thrilled that you're all able to be with us. Um, first, I, I guess the, the biggest question to ask is, do you guys still think CRBSI is still a problem? Uh, if you look at the Joint Commission website or the CDC website, they're not so focused on it anymore. In fact, uh, the information that they have in their uh, arsenal, they both have toolboxes listed with ideas and uh, publications on fighting CRBSI, but nothing is more recent than 2013, 2014. So for the last five years, they really haven't posted anything new. Uh, they do update the reported amounts, uh, rates of CRBSI. Uh, but in 2015, we stopped the way we reported as a percentage and started reporting as SIR. And I'll go into that a little bit as well. But some just general information. Um, I know that right now everybody is very focused on COVID-19 and that COVID-19 prevention and COVID-19 treatment are really taking up the majority of bandwidth in hospitals, so to speak. And that's certainly understandable, but let's not forget that CLABSI is still a problem. About 30,000 people every year still get a CRBSI in the United States, and costs are still running anywhere from forty dollars to $100,000 to treat one infection. In fact, hospital-acquired infections still are a problem. Uh, the CDC stated that on any given day, one in 31 hospitalized patients will still get a hospital acquired infection. One out of every 31 didn't come into the hospital with an infection, but 
will be treated for one while they're there. Now that includes all infections, including surgical site infections, uh, ventilator acquired pneumonia, things of that nature. Uh, but let's think about CLABSI specifically. The mortality for CLABSI still remains at 12 to 25%, despite our best actions and activities. One out of every four people get a, that get a CRBSI are going to die from it. And I'm sure you feel like I do, but that is just not okay. We need to do something about that. Still approximately 723,000 people every year get a hospital acquired infection. And out of those 728,000, about 99,000 of them will die from that hospital acquired infection. That's way more deaths than we're willing to sacrifice. And that's not even mentioning the costs. A couple of interesting things that have happened regarding the CLABSI reporting or CRBSI reporting. Uh, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably during our presentation today. Acute care facilities have not had to report CLABSI numbers from June, from, I'm sorry, March 15th through June 30th of this year. And that date may be pushed even further out. Uh, that's the mandate from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. They basically said that uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic that we don't have to report our CLABSI numbers because they're not going to use them to calculate any penalties or reimbursement. Now that doesn't mean that NHSN won't still collect your data. They certainly will if you are going to report it. But what it does is take the pressure off of the infection preventionists to have to collect the CLABSI data every day in uh, when they're focusing on the pandemic instead. Now, a lot of other people that um, are involved in CLABSI prevention have asked me, what defines a CLABSI? What exactly gets reported to the national uh, hospital network? Um, what exactly should we be worried about? And so I wanna clarify some of the terms that are used for, by NHSN to collect data. Uh, a central line to them is any intravascular catheter that terminates at or close to the heart or in one of the great vessels and is used for infusion, withdrawal of blood, or hemodynamic monitoring. These catheters have got to be in use for at least two consecutive days, calendar days. Day one is the first day of insertion or, or access. So, for example, um, any internal jugular catheter is a central line. But there are some devices that you might consider central lines in your hospital or treat them like central lines, but they're not considered central lines for the reporting purposes. And these are some examples of things that are not considered reportable central lines. Things like midlines, peripheral IVs, of course, but ventricular assist devices, ECMO devices, AV fistulas, grafts, arterial catheters. Um, it's important to note though, however, umbilical catheters, all umbilical catheters are considered central lines. So these are NHSN definitions. Honestly, it's getting more difficult to find the reported numbers for hospitals uh, because of the way things are reported now. In 2015, the NHSN decided to kind of find a way to even the playing field. So they created a formula called a standardized infection ratio. And they take the raw numbers that are reported, the number of catheters in use, the number of infections, and put those into a formula that takes into account things like the type of hospital that you are in. Uh, is it a community hospital? Is it a teaching hospital? Is it a very large hospital? Is it a small hospital? And so they try to, to level the playing field that way by using this ratio. So now 
reporting is done by standardized infection ratio. And in 2015, the standardized infection ratio of one became the baseline. So everyone that had an SIR higher than one was doing worse than the baseline, lower than one was doing better than the baseline. However, the standardized infection ratio has gone down as a baseline every year since then. This is a map of the United States and the darker the color of your state, the higher your standardized infection ratio is in your state overall. So the darkest colored states, they're at anywhere between 76 and 0.76 and 0.97. We don't have anyone higher than 0.97 at this point, which is great. So overall, things are definitely improving. Judy, we're at the South Pole. Time for another poll. Perfect. Are you members of a collapse prevention committee? Yes, no, or your facility does not have one. All righty, we're going to close this poll and I'll show you the results. 34% of you on this are, 54 not, and 12% do not have one, Chris. One reason that I ask is because there are some great resources available to hospitals. One, uh, this is specifically from the Joint Commission. They actually have a CLABSI toolkit. Like I said, some of the information out there is actually outdated because they haven't updated their toolkit since 2013. But a lot of the basics still apply. And there are some excellent ideas uh, that you can use and suggest to your hospital in case uh, they're not following all of these great um, ideas and using all these great tools. Another great resource for CLABSI prevention is the CDC. Their website has uh, some excellent tools as well. They, again, haven't really been updated since probably about 2013 or 2014, as far as the toolkit goes, but the basics are there and there's some great resources there as well for you. So you might be interested to know um, although CLABSIs are declining and the standardized infection ratio has gone down uh, nationally, what exactly are we worrying about? What germs should we be nervous about? Well, this is a report from the NHSN data collected um, as of 2017, and it still shows MRSA as number one. Uh, your first column is the hospital wards, non-ICU departments. And then the second column are your hospital ICUs. They still break them out in those two categories. So Staph aureus is still our number one biggest enemy when it comes to CLABSI outside of the ICU. But inside the ICU, we're more worried about Staph epi, uh, coag, neg coag negative staph, which is Staph epi. That is still number one. And you're looking at about 13% of all infections versus uh, staph aureus outside the hospital is or outside the ICU is about 15%. What is really concerning though is number two in the ICU is candida albicans. That's still 10% of all central line infections. Why is Canada such a concern in the ICU? It's because of its mortality rate. It has a much higher mortality rate than a lot of the other bacteria or uh, germs that attack our lines. Um, the mortality rate for Canada, it can be up as high as 28%. Candida albicans is by far the leading type of candida infection that you'll see in the ICU. Um, some of these other ones can be very difficult to treat. They're drug resistant. But candida albicans out of all the candida species is about 37%. A particularly concerning type of infection that we're seeing in the ICUs now outside of the COVID world is candida auris. 
this is a very scary germ because this fungal infection has a 33% mortality rate, guys. That's right. One in every three people that get Candida auris will die from it. It's extremely difficult to identify because it mimics a lot of the other Candida species. And it's also multi-drug resistant. So the things that we typically use to treat Candida albicans and other Candida illnesses will not work with Candida auris. It's very frightening because it was first identified very recently, only in 2009 in Asia and traveled very quickly over here to the United States. As of May of this year, we have 1,122 cases nationally. And New York and Illinois are the hotbeds. And New York has almost 500 cases. That's not really surprising considering how many people uh, come into the United States from international destinations through New York. That's likely how it's spread. Uh, but it's something that we all have to be aware of uh, because every month there are more and more states that report Canada forest infections. So now that I've scared you all and, and reminded you about uh, the importance of collapsing prevention, I want to talk a little bit about things that we're currently doing now. It's hard to believe, but it's been 15 years since the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Initiatives, came out with their Save 5 Million Lives campaign. And they're the ones that first came up with those five things that we should do that are now very well accepted as our central line insertion bundle. Avoiding the use of femoral sites getting femoral lines out as soon as possible, maximum barrier precautions, hand washing, use of chlorhexidine and to prep sites before insertion, daily review of line necessity. Those things are pretty ingrained in everybody's practice at this point. So what are some of the other things that we have started to do? Well, there's been a renewed focus on hand washing and scrubbing the hubs of our IV catheters. A lot of education surrounding that. We've also employed some chlorhexidine based products, uh, dressings that help prevent germs from getting into the IV site. The use of maximum barrier precautions sterile techniques and ultrasound for first attempt success and the use of impregnated catheters. These are all fairly common in hospitals today. Let's talk about some new approaches. Probably one of the most recent things that uh, we have been implementing in every hospital across the United States is the resurgence of midline catheters. There's been a pendulum swing for a while. We went away from using midline catheters. And part of that was due to the confusion between a midline and a PIC. Midlines would be used inappropriately for central medications, medications that needed to be given to central circulation. And because of the concerns surrounding them and some of the complications, hospitals went away from using them. They have come back into vogue, so to speak. And some of the reasons for that are some of the new insertion techniques for midline catheters. We now have all-in-one devices and accelerated Seldinger technique. We've made midline catheters power injectable. So now you can get a midline that can be used in CAT scan and MRI for power injection of contrast. That didn't always exist, but that made them more utilitarian. We're also constantly looking for alternatives to central venous catheters and PIC lines. Because if you don't have a central venous catheter, you can't get a central venous catheter infection, correct? Sometimes that is the appropriate way to prevent an infection. However, sometimes it's not. And sometimes you really need a central catheter. So we need our vascular access specialists to really be in control 
of deciding what type of catheter the patient needs to successfully complete their therapy with the least amount and the least risk of complications. We've also seen an increased use of peripheral IVs. And part of that is driven by the fact that very many hospitals have gone to clinically indicated changes for peripheral IVs. Did you know that the first time the time length of dwell time was removed from the INS standard was 2011? A lot of people don't realize that it's been nine years since the dwell time limits have been removed for catheters. Not every hospital has gone to clinically indicated changes for peripheral IVs, but many, many have. And there's quite a bit published now in support of that, showing that there's really no higher risk uh, in leaving catheters in until they fail. But the key to you doing peripherally indicated uh, peripheral IV changes is education. Your staff has to understand what clinically indicated really means, what a bad IV looks like, feels like, um, how it works, how it responds. In fact, I have a little story to share. I was doing a point prevalence in a hospital. I am very honored to be able to travel the country and uh, visit many hospitals and learn what their practices are and, and help them be successful in avoiding infections and other complications. So I was rounding and uh, checked on a pick line on a patient and noticed they had a peripheral IV lower in the arm, in the same arm as the pick line. But it was hep locked off, closed off, not used. Um, but the site itself was red, and you could tell it was a, a bit ten, a bit swollen. So I asked the nurse, uh, was she aware that the patient also had a peripheral IV lower in the in the forearm toward the wrist? And she said, Oh yes, definitely. So after we left the patient's room, I asked her, I said, Can you explain to me why the patient still has a peripheral IV that isn't being used? when they have a pick line in, in the same arm. And she very seriously responded to me, oh, because we only change the peripheral IVs when clinically indicated. So I said, okay, makes sense to me, that, that's great. So can you explain to me, I asked her, what is clinically indicated for you guys? How do you decide that? And she replied, well, it's when the doctor orders it. Oops, I, I was very surprised to hear that uh, because I think we all realize that a doctor is not going to order a peripheral IV to be removed. They probably don't even realize their patients still have the peripheral IV in place once the pick line is placed. So just to remind everybody that peripherally indicated, uh, clinically indicated changes for peripheral IVs is excellent uh, for your patient but you wanna make sure that your staff understands exactly what that means. We've also seen a emergence of impregnated picks and midlines. And these picks and midlines are now impregnated with antimicrobials or antiseptic treatments. And this is fantastic because now you have another treated catheter that you can use in your arsenal especially if your patient is suspected of having a central line infection. They're great to use for patients in the rule out infection category um, or other high risk patients such as burn patients or uh, oncology patients who are at high risk. These are some of the handouts that are available on the CDC website. Another new thing that we've been doing is educating our patients. It used to be that we would go into the patient's room, do the tasks we need to do, and be on our way. Uh, now we have to involve the patients in their care. In fact, it's one of the Joint Commission standards is that patients need to understand the risks of having a central venous catheter. So handouts such as this one from the CDC are, are excellent for that. 
purpose. This one is actually even endorsed by APIC. Uh, you'll see clean hands posters all over the hospital, reminding not only healthcare providers, but patients and visitors to wash their hands frequently because clean hands are safe hands. These tools to help educate your patients and allow the patients and the caregivers to take ownership of their line, it's very important to preventing collapsing. Uh, we're all human. We all make mistakes. There are always lapses in, in um, habits. And so we shouldn't be offended or put off if a patient asks us to please wash our hands or reminds us to use an alcohol wipe before they enter our central venous catheter. I think the more we encourage patients to take ownership in that way of their health care, the better off the hospital will be, and certainly the better off the patients will be. Hey, Judy, time for a totem pole. I love a totem pole. Here it comes. So does your facility use alcohol caps? Yes on all lines, only on central lines, or no? And we're finding 44% put them on all lines. And then it's split 28%, 28% on central lines only, or no, they don't use them. That's fantastic information. Thanks everybody for sharing that. I ask because alcohol caps are one of the new approaches that we have to preventing infection. And as reflected in the poll, it seems like many hospitals have adopted them. And they are fantastic when used with certain types of needless connectors. However, they're not inexpensive. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And they're only good for one-time use. They can't be reused. Uh, they don't eliminate swabbing completely. Uh, when you take off an alcohol cap, after you do that initial flush, you then still need to scrub the hub with an alcohol wipe uh, before you connect up your IV medication. And then after you disconnect your medication, you should wipe, scrub that hub again with alcohol before you attach your flush. And then you can replace a new alcohol cap on before you walk away from the patient. Compliance with using alcohol caps is an ongoing challenge. And this is really why some hospitals have found that their alcohol caps are not as effective as they thought they would be. Um, this type of alcohol cap with the pad inside of it has been replaced for one of these companies with a uh, dam, so to speak, that when you attach the alcohol cap, it bathes the connector in alcohol. One time kind of whoosh. This one still has, some of the other ones still have that white alcohol sponge, so to speak, at the top of it. Um, but what the alcohol caps don't do is they don't address the threads at all. So that's one reason that you need to use some friction to really clean the septum and the threads and in between each uh, access, each and every access. There's also been some reports of the alcohol caps not being very effective when they're not used on all lines across the hospital. So if you're in one of those, that 20% of hospitals that are only using it on central lines, but your patients still have peripheral IVs as well, or midlines that are not getting the alcohol caps and you're not seeing zero, that might be part of the reason why. Compliance is a challenge with these. Uh, you have to keep reminding nurses to, to keep using them. When they first hit the hospital, everybody's excited about them and they want to use them. And then as time goes by, we revert to our old habits. It's human nature, unfortunately. Um, as I stated, these alcohol caps are not inexpensive. Uh, they range anywhere from as high as 40, 45 cents each to about 20 cents uh, as compared to a plain alcohol pad, which is about one cent. And uh, the CHG alcohol wipes 
um, they run about 10 cents. So if you add it up over time when you're replacing those caps all day long, it can get kind of pricey. So we've looked at a lot of different options, a lot of different things that you guys might be doing to prevent infections now. But I wonder, have you looked at your needleless connector? All of the interventions that we've seen focused really on the outside of the catheter, um, the outside, the insertion of the catheter, the catheter itself, treated or non-treated. Um, but nothing really focuses on the intraluminal pathway or the entryway to your patient. Pictured here are some of the devices that are currently on the market. The ones across the top row here that you see, these are all considered neutral or they're marketed as neutral connectors. These down here on the right-hand side are still available and these are negative displacement connectors. So what a negative displacement connector does is, now this only applies to connection and disconnection from a syringe, but just to clarify, a negative displacement connector will draw blood back into the back of the catheter when you disconnect your syringe. These three here on the left-hand side are all positive displacement connectors. And so what these do is when you disconnect your syringe, they will give a little positive bolus of saline out the, hopefully out the back of the catheter. Hopefully it's enough to push all the blood back out of the catheter. Um, and what's important with these that are positive is that you don't clamp the catheter until after it gives itself that little bolus. So you definitely do not want to clamp your catheter when you have a positive displacement device until after it gives that bolus. Hey, Judy, how about another poll? What type of needleless connector do you use at your facility? Okay, I'm gonna close this poll and share with you. Positive displacement at 30%, neutral 44%, 7% um, at negative, 9% no idea, and 10% use more than one type. That's really interesting. Um, I find in a lot of hospitals when I'm traveling across the country that the hospitals do use more than one type of needleless connector in their facility. Uh, some are department specific, some are specific. They use one type for central lines, one type for peripheral IVs. Uh, sometimes uh, it is a matter of we're using up the old stuff before we use the new stuff. Um, and because of that, a mix of different connectors come into play. That is interesting, but it does create confusion in a hospital. If there's more than one type of connector, especially if clamping sequence is important, as it is with positive and negative, um, it can cause some confusion. And that confusion can actually raise your occlusion rates. And we know that occlusion rates are tied to infection rates. So that's something to think about. So a little bit more about needleless connectors. Uh, let's see what Dr. Jarvis has to say. Dr. William Jarvis uh, was employed by the CDC for more than 20 years. He's got more than 400 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and he is one of the foremost experts on infectious diseases and epidemiology. He wrote an article in Infection Control Today and to say what his ideal needleless connector would be. And I share this with you because I want you to take a look at the needleless connector that you're using in your hospital and see how many of these benefits or features that it checks off. Does it have a smooth septum surface? His ideal connector would have a tight seal between the septum and the housing. There would be a straight fluid pathway so it's easy to flush, no places for germs or blood to hide. It would have little to no dead space because the more dead space you have, the higher um, amount of reflux you have and also the higher risk of biofilm formation. It would have a direct fluid pathway with no moving parts. It shouldn't require a clamping sequence which would eliminate the clamping sequence confusion. 
it should be transparent so you can see whether or not you've flushed it completely. It should, of course, be lure access with little to no blood reflux into the catheter on connection or disconnection. And it should be able to be flushed with normal saline only. We've really moved away from using heparin in the hospitals um, and really across the United States in many care settings. And one of the reasons for that is heparin has not proven to be any better in keeping catheters patent than normal saline alone. And also heparin is tied to some complications such as biofilm formation, um, growth of microbes, and also heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So what is new with preventing CLABSI? Well, to me, the biggest new thing is something that's been around since 1954, believe it or not, chlorhexidine. Um, chlorhexidine is one of the keys to preventing central line infections in many different ways. Um, I don't know if you know how chlorhexidine works. I found it to be very interesting myself. So let me share it with you. Chlorhexidine is a positively charged ion and it forms an ionic bond to the cell walls of the bacteria, of viruses, of fungus, and it actually tears those cell walls apart, trying to get in and rupture the internal membranes of these cells as well. So the positively charged chlorhexidine binds to the cell wall and causes that cell membrane to rupture, causing cell death. It also has the bonus of inhibiting some biofilm formation because it inhibits the adherence of microbes to a surface. It prevents them from sticking to things like silicones and polyurethanes. Chlorhexidine, like I said, has been around since 1954. It's not new, but it's unique as an antiseptic. It's not affected at all in the presence of fluids, blood, other body fluids, and it actually binds to human tissue. That's what allows it to have the residual that can last at least 48 hours. It's been proven that daily chlorhexidine bathing in the intensive care units can reduce all sorts of infection risks. It reduces all of the hospital acquired infections that we talked about earlier. Ventilator acquired pneumonia, surgical site infections, and of course, abscesses as well. It works so well that, and because it comes in different forms, it can be impregnated into different medical devices. It's very common in dental devices and oral use because it binds very easily to your uh, oral mucosa. It's used in implants. It's used in vascular catheters. And it's also used in dressings. In fact, the, there has been a chlorhexidine impregnated central venous catheter on the market since 1992. Um, if you use a blue central venous catheter, that is an antimicrobial catheter that has chlorhexidine impregnated into it. Uh, so it is very excellent to use and uh, for your patients, especially those at risk for central line infections. But now it's also impregnated in a needleless connector. The wonderful thing about chlorhexidine is it kills all organisms, viruses, bacteria, even resistant bacteria. And so far we have not developed any bacteria that are resistant to chlorhexidine, despite its use since, 19, since the 1950s. Judy, I guess it's time for another poll. What do you use to clean your needleless connector? Isopropyl alcohol, chlorhexidine glutinate, and 70% isopropyl or other? Yeah, I put other in there in case you guys use one of those scrubbers. Um, they're only alcohol, but you might think of it as different than just an alcohol pad or a wipe. 
Thanks for that clarification, Chris. Okay, let's find out what people said. So we have 74% that use 70% or 70% um, isopropyl alcohol, 24, so a quarter use chlorhexidine and isopropyl, and the 2% are in the other category. Okay, so most of you are using regular alcohol wipes. And I think that's great. It's very effective and very cost effective as well. Speaking of costs, let's do a little bit of a cost analysis. I did mention that there is a chlorhexidine and silver impregnated needleless connector available on the market. And I'm sure you're thinking, gee, Chris, that's great. Yeah, it does work 24 seven, um, but it is more expensive. Absolutely, and I'm sure you guessed that already. So, but let's take a second here and compare the cost of using a non-treated connector and an alcohol cap compared to using a chlorhexidine treated needleless connector and a regular one cent alcohol wipe. If you're making some assumptions here that the average patient it has a double lumen catheter and you're accessing that catheter about eight times a day, like a typical ICU patient, if you add up the cost of your connector with your alcohol cap, you're spending about $2 a day on that patient. That's using a 96 hour connector change. With a treated connector, you can go to a seven day connector change and you no longer need the cost of the alcohol cap. So now your daily spend for that patient is down to only 65 cents. This can generate a cost savings of 43%, ranging from somewhere $117,000 a year down to only about $21,000 a year. So if your hospital is concerned about saving money as all of them are, something you might wanna consider. Well, gee, Chris, that's great, you're thinking, but does it work? So you don't have to take my word for it and I wouldn't expect that you do. I want you to do your own research. So let me give you some opinions from some of the people that use it. This is a hospital that converted. And once their conversion of the was complete, they went seven months without one clapsy. Here's another hospital, a little bit bigger, 800 bed level two trauma center, used to use alcohol caps on their connectors, but they weren't getting the rates that they expected. They didn't see the drop in clapsy. So they switched to a needleless connector with chlorhexidine silver for all lines, central and peripheral. And not only did they see a 41% drop in their clapsies, one ICU dropped 70%, but they also saw a TPA usage drop 47%. They saved their hospital over $500,000. This was a poster that was presented um, at APIC in 2018. That same hospital now, as of March, they have one unit that's gone more than two years, 1,062 days without a collapse at zero. One of their ICUs has gone more than a year, 411 days. Their oncology unit has gone 400 days, clabsy free. Two of their medical units, 144 days. And their CIC, which is a coronary unit, went 175 days, clabsy free. So is zero possible? Yes. It, it really is, even in the days of COVID-19. Um, is it an easy fix? No, it's not. And Sophie Harnage and her team at Sutter Health Roseville proved that zero is possible. They went seven years with zero. They went 10 years with one clabsy, over 20,000 pick lines. So is it possible? Absolutely. But if you take a look at her bundle, she truly used a bundle. It was not only products, it was also people. It was practices. They literally took ownership of every line in that facility. And they were able to do it um, with 
implementing the right products for their patient population and really policing and, and taking ownership of their central lines. So is it possible? Yes, and this is your call to action. I certainly hope that uh, when you can focus on something other than COVID-19, which will be soon, very soon I hope, you'll be able to take another look at your CLABSIs in your hospital. If you don't have a central line prevention committee in your hospital, see if you can champion one and get one set up because it takes a village, takes a team to do this. Take a look at your processes, take a look at your products, take a look at your people um, and you can fight the good fight and get to zero. I wanna thank you all very much for your time this afternoon. It was an excellent uh, period of time and, and I appreciate, I know that you're all very busy. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have today or uh, if you think of something tomorrow or next week, please reach out to me. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate this. And I wanna make sure that I do thank our sponsor for today, which is RIMED Technologies for sponsoring our webinar today and for Chris speaking. We do have questions already for you, Chris. So uh, first question we have is, should we blood culture everyone coming into the hospital with central line? That is not a current recommendation. Uh, the idea is the hospital only has to report central line infections when they are. <laughs> I do these <laughs> Awesome. Um, the hospital reports central lines after the second day that they've been accessed. So uh, if there are signs and symptoms of a central line infection, then do your normal central line infection workup. Uh, but everybody should not be cultured across the board. It's very costly to run blood cultures and not necessary for every single person. Hi, folks. We apologize, but we had to stop the Q&A section due to technical difficulties. We appreciate each and every one of you. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you at our next webinar. <laughs>